Would you kindly give me your attention as I tell you about this? So with all the details, um, it's like, you know, uh, kind of entering another society as if you were an anthropologist and you were going to go, and they're saying, we want you to go and visit these um, Amazonian tribal people and live amongst them. And wait, I was trained for Eskimos, you know, or I've been, I've been working on uh, in Scottish anthropology and studying Highlanders. And, you know, every time you have to uh, adapt to a new society, Anytime you're writing about a video game, I also wrote Halo um, Broken Circle, one of the Halo games, and that was a whole different kind of immersion. One was under the water and the other was out in the stars, but it just had a completely different tone. And it was like a, a different society, like as, as deeply contrasted uh, as between Amazonians and um, uh, Eskimos. Now, when you write one of these books um, inspired by a video game, unless you're writing fan fiction, which is cool, which is a thing, uh, it's, it's something you have to be invited to, to do. You have to be uh, invited to do it by the people who have the rights. And uh, I've never heard of anybody just going, raising their hand and saying, can I write a book based on this? And they say yes. They usually pick out people who have a background in adapting from different worlds. I have dozens of novels under my own name that have nothing to do with, with established uh, franchises. And uh, my novel, song, my, the, uh, the A Song Called Youth Cyberpunk trilogy is coming out again in October. It's being brought out by uh, Dover Books. And that's just completely my invention. But uh, I worked on lots of uh, world things because I'm a professional writer and that's all I do. I don't have a day job except for that. So world writing uh, is where you are uh, you know, adapting from the world of a franchise. I've written Batman novel, a Batman novel. I've written uh, a, a, an alien novel, yeah, as in aliens, you know, as in uh, Ridley Scott. Um, I've written a Predator novel. And I chose to go back to, on that one, I chose to go back to the uh, original films and start from there. And this was encouraged by the studio. And so that means that I, I didn't consult all these comic books that had come out. And I got angry letters from fans who were like really into those comic books. And the comic books had a whole different kind of creation story for Predator. Um, but I had been instructed. They called me an arrogant bastard and so on. Things like this were said in, in the comments. And, so I mention that because there's, uh, there is a, a kind of a, an area for conflict and, but, and kind of a love-hate thing going on between uh, writers of books like this and the fans. And fans will put a lot of pressure on you. And sometimes they're not fair, and sometimes um, they're all too fair, like when they remind you that, that you, it, it uh, would you kindly. They're painfully right sometimes. Um, but so the, you want to avoid that as much as possible. You want to make everybody happy. And that means you have to steer your way through a, a minefield uh, conceptually and artistically. And one of, the, one of the big challenges is that you have to work with a huge committee of unseen people. I mean, generally, you never meet them in person. Occasionally, but mostly it's it's just voices on a phone conference between you, you know, and the and the work that you're doing. And um, so Ken Levine, creator of Bioshock, 
more than any other single person, I guess, anyway. He, he really gave it its uh, more, most identifiable features. And uh, he was the point man on it. But lots of other people were creators, co-creators of Bioshock, the game. Um, Levine and I were on the phone during phone conferences quite a bit. And, um, th and this was his baby. Uh, and so there was like, a, who the hell is this guy, Shirley? And uh, what's his attitude and how cooperative is he going to be? And is he going to be just a hack? And you kind of pick these things up from uh, between the lines, you know, as we spoke. But eventually, um, I was approved, and uh, no, I was approved to be be allowed to write um, a, a short like uh, outline for the novel. I had to, I had to be approved like three times, and uh, the first time I had to write the okay, you're approved to write the outline, and then we'll approve that, and if we don't like that. You know, no contract. Uh, and it was a pretty good payday. And besides, I had played Bioshock. And um, I liked it. And I, I just felt, wow, what a rich environment, you know, uh, and, and, and what character it had. Uh, and what kind of like diabolic energy was there. Um, and, and also the kind of social ramifications of it were uh, interested me. I mean, I put my own slant on it, and Levine had his slant. Uh, I never actually figured out what he definitely believes. I don't think he knows either. But uh, he just thought that the kind of uh, laissez-faire, Ayn Randian fixation uh, was a fascinating thing and what would happen. Whereas I, I view it as actually a kind of social cancer. Uh, but I couldn't say that directly in the novel. Huh? <laughs> um, but it comes across them. So I had to write an outline, and the outline uh, had to be in chapter by chapter, pretty much, and that's with a summary at the beginning. And we'd already agreed that it would be a prequel. Um, and this was, you know, I think Ken Levine's idea, really. Um, perhaps because he didn't want anything that would interfere with the, uh, the you know, like come into conflict with the, with the overall facts of the game too much. And um, uh, if it didn't work that well, he could say, well, it wasn't the game, it was a prequel. But um, in fact, it eventually had changed form. And when I'm reading about the development of Rapture and Bioshock, the game, I just was struck by uh, how much evolution it went through. And it, it was years evolving as a sort of little uh, sibling of the, um, uh, the you know, uh, and, and the, the other shock games, shock, uh, system shock games. And, and then uh, it became more um, its own character. And, but first, you know, it went through this, this period where it was basically about robots and, and our relationship to them. But it, eventually it became about the world, you know, this strange vision that takes us underneath the sea. Um, and that took, a, you know, a two or three years, I think, uh, to get there. And it really started when he, uh, Levine, went to New York City and visited Rockefeller Square. You may or may, you probably, a lot of you know this. Um, and was struck by the story of, of Rockefeller himself, who's kind of the model for, um, for Andrew Ryan in the Bioshock books. And uh, he was struck by the uh, uh, architecture, the kind of um, uh, Art Deco style, and but also a, there's this sort of special industrial energy or, or strength to it, um, and uh, that you see at Rockefeller uh, Plaza, and that was, and and the building there, it was it was all ordained. 
uh, by this en enormously powerful magnate, Rockefeller, and um, in the early 20th century. Uh, and it's very much a, 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 is a part of the, um, um, the robber baron's culture. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can we switch it with? It's too loud or not loud enough? Not loud enough, I think. You, to... you got, you're not hearing me? There we go. That's a little better. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe we should have done that yesterday. I think maybe, yeah, yeah. Um, I apologize. Uh, okay. So Rockefeller was a uh, at the heart of the uh, the inspiration for Bioshock and uh, the robber baron culture that he came from. I mean that wasn't what he called it, but it was it was the, the culture of of uh, people who were really very uh, powerful uh, capitalist guys and they were not going to let anything stand in their way and they built the railroads and they and uh, they built this they built as they saw it civilization as it was ar arising at the time um, and you know they were had were very much uh, about just don't stand in my way and I'll do great things for everybody but don't don't try and and modify me you know uh, don't put too many rules in my way, and they and they bought uh, politicians and and uh, broke the rules uh, as they pleased, um, and so he uh, he he at the same time, uh, Levine read about um, uh, early libertarianism and Ayn Rand, who wrote Atlas Shrugged and wrote these books that have been. Uh, influential with uh, the American right, uh, and uh, just thought, wow, what if what if that kind of vision of of um, self uh, selfhood over over a collectivity is basically the bottom of it? I mean, her idea is that if everybody is acts selfishly in in a concerted way, somehow it'll all shuffle out, and then with the magic of the free market and and Darwinian social evolution uh, will all uh, ultimately benefit somehow. Um, and uh, of course, the, in, in real life, things are more complex. Uh, competition is really a good thing. Uh, but then uh, uncontrolled co competition without some rules. Like in a game, you have rules. But in, in the game that she envisages, envisaged, there are no rules, were no rules. Uh, except um, success, essentially, uh, and um, a competition leading to your success, and, and people working uh, with, uh, and with the sweat of their brow, their brow toiling to make a living. Um, and you know, they some people, and it's going to end up being hierarchical because there are employees and employers, uh, but everybody can start a business themselves, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, you, and, um, and this idea of kind of a trickle-down concept in the early stages in the old ways. So what if there was, there was a place where that could exist uh, unrestrained and grow according to some central figure's personal vision? And that central figure was Andrew Ryan. And uh, he transposed all that uh, into the, the underwater uh, society uh, that was rapture. Um, and so uh, Ryan invited, you know, th thousands and thousands of people to come and, and to start businesses and also work for other businesses and just work their asses off and, and uh, make it, uh, uh, you know, a grand, as he thought, um, utopia. He was trying to create a utopia. But it should be remembered, to be fair to Ryan, that, uh, and this is something dramatized in the novel, um, right before he really made the big push for it, um, Hiroshima, Nagasaki uh, were more or less incinerated uh, by, the, uh, by nuclear weapons. And uh, and then Russians, uh, had obtained their own nuclear weapons. 
and were developing those. Uh, and it became obvious to him, he, at least he felt it was obvious, that, that a, a nuclear holocaust was inevitable. The world was going to fry up there. But the, and the only place to escape was the bottom of the deep blue sea. So he felt that he was saving humanity in that sense. Um, you know, he's, he's creating not only an alternate society, but the only society that will survive, he believes, because of the imminence of nuclear holocaust. And this gave him this huge imperative, and he uh, convinced you know, his followers and his people that this too was, this was uh, the imperative, uh, not only the, the hope of, uh, of a great society, uh, but a, the hope of, the only hope of society, the only hope of the world. Uh, and he, he put all of his, kind of Rockefeller type assets into building this thing down there. And so eventually it worked out that the book was a prequel and then more than a prequel because we jumped in ahead to where the first kind of trouble starts in rapture in the, uh, and, and then into some of those events. And that wasn't originally supposed to happen as in, a, in accordance with my outline and their acceptance of it. Uh, but part way through, when I was like two thirds done with the book, I was told that it also needed to incorporate Bioshock 2. Um, and uh, you know, yeah, that was exasperating because that's not what I was being paid for. And that, so that meant that I had to stop and start over in a, to a large extent. Some parts I could keep, but then I had to rethink and I had to repitch uh, the second whole second half of the book, and I had to, had to work in the uh, the character of Ms. Lamb and and uh, the sort of uh, uh, you know socialistic uh, thing that that was uh, building up around her, and and um, and then um, you know the resistance kind of that kind of that we see in Bioshock too. Um, and so that should give you an idea, though, uh, in itself of the vicissitudes faced by a writer uh, in adapting from a video game or from anything else. If it could also have been that I was writing um, a Predator novel and then a new Predator thing was, was about to come out, maybe a TV series, and they, we've decided we want to incorporate characters from this TV series in, into the novel, but I'm mostly done with the novel. So you'll pay me again? Well, no. But, and somewhere in my contract it says that I have to suck it up and, you know, I could have cut that out and that may, might have scotched the deal or not. So, you know, I, but I, I, I adapted, I adapt, and you constantly adapt when you're adapting. You constantly have to, have to, uh, you know, you get, you get notes, first of all, and anybody, some of you may have worked in video games, and uh, you're constantly bombarded with notes as you work in your area of a video game. I've done some of that. I worked with Telltale Games a bit. Uh, and at every level, almost every day, the pe people are getting notes on their work. Um, they're getting people, they're, they're a, a committee somewhere, and it may be the committee below the committee below the committee. <laughs> you know, you may have to go, if, if you're really sufficiently finished, it may go through three more committees, um, depending on how big the company is, especially w like uh, EA or something. So, um, you're constantly fielding notes. And, um, and adapting to them. Um, and you just have to live with that. That's just part of, uh, and it's kind of like, just, I also worked in Hollywood. Uh, I, I worked on a, a television show called VR5. I worked on, a, I worked on a dark, uh, Deep Space Nine. And uh, it's, it's a committee process, and if you're, you're either in one, or you're consulting one, or it's a round table of people, and they're talking as if they're all uh, creative collaborators. 
but really it's sort of like you take a creative idea and you chop it up and try and everybody finally works on it and, and it becomes some mutually decided upon recipe and you know for some reason the the analogy of food making is is with me this moment it's, it's almost as if I, I can still smell carbohydrates like raining down on me and and, and it's back. And in fact, the the recipes at the, at the you know as you work are often mapley. They're very mapley. There was maple bacon in the last. I, yeah, I, I figured something like that. Um, okay, so uh, you, you know that uh, Levine's um, vision of uh, those two big things that setting. Uh, that that kind of early uh, beginning to middle 20th century industrial and culture, uh, the backdrop of, of impending uh, world destruction, um, all and and uh, the Ayn Rand content. Uh, his name is a is a partial anagram of Ayn Rand, uh, Andrew Ryan. Uh, that gives it its big overall character. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you have these powerful figures go stalking through it, uh, transform people who have taken Adam and uh, the, uh, the big daddies. And uh, uh, so I, have to, I had to make my way through that. And what you do is find point of view. Um, and the point of view that we agreed on was uh, Bill McDonough. I was I wanted to make up a character because I didn't want the the people who played the game to know what would happen to the character eventually. And Bill McDonough gets killed at the end. Um, he he is he's found dead. It's mentioned that he's found dead in at toward the end of the book. So I wanted to have a character that, you know, who had just seen it and it was off on the side and was maybe a minor functionary and wasn't really a character named in the game, because that would give me so much more freedom and also wouldn't give away the arc of the story. But uh, Ken and I disagreed on, on that, and he was the boss. So, And Bill worked out well for a lot of reasons, because he had a strong, innate character. He was a working class guy. He was a plumber. I mean, you've got this important person who is sort of an engineer uh, for much of Rapture, and but his basic training was as a plumber. Uh, and that kind of reverberates back to like the, a man starting at the, at the bottom of society and, and working his way up. I'm, I'm a working class guy and then, and then I give you the opportunity and I, you're gonna take it and succeed. That's, so he embodied that. Uh, but he also had a conscience uh, and was constantly worried about things going wrong in Rapture. Um, and eventually he and his wife and, and daughter, um, you know, were critical to the end of the story. And if you haven't read the book, I won't tell you what happens to them. But there are other viewpoint characters. I got very into the character of the... Uh, doctor who is a sort of a, a plastic, mad plastic surgeon in the books. And um, it was, you know, he's, he's deforming people hideously and transforming them and playing the, with them. Uh, and, and, he, and he's a, a very dangerous psychopathic person. And you see this pattern in, bio, in Rapture uh, people become more and more psychopathic as they go. Um, you see it in, in the, the books, you see it in the game, um, and, the, and, you, and you see these guys who, you find the evidence for, for, for this when you, you come upon their audio diaries and maybe splashes of blood on the wall and, and uh, hear the horrifying stories, uh, and then you encounter them and they're completely out of their minds, uh, usually because they experimented with Adam and with other uh, uh, variants of, of drugs. And so it's like a lot like a MAGFest. 
and I think I've seen a couple of times, I've seen big daddies with little sisters at MAGFest uh, uh, walking around, except they're not in costume. They're just uh, these uh, women who are, seem to be controlling these big lumbering figures that walk around. <laughs> And uh, it's almost as if they're, you know, maybe they've sort of psychologically hacking them using, uh, using uh, pheromones, I think, is the key, possibly. Uh, are they hormonally hacking, they've hormonally hacked the big daddies uh, of MAGFest, and, uh, and they've, they've, these big guys follow them everywhere and do as they wish. And also, you'll notice that this is like a bottom floor, it's like, and it's cold down here a lot. <laughs> You know, I look out the window, there's a fountain. It's, it's raining a lot. It's like, it's, and it's, there's just glass between us and that water out there and the rain. And the, the next story up uh, is civilization. That's, uh, so we, you know, there, there's, there's a, a, a magfest feel about it. Also, also because it's, it's like, it has a superficial con, uh, structure. Um, that really de uh, degrades and goes out of control very easily, especially late at night, <laughs> I've noticed. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, but that may be revealing because, because rapture is a microcosm of world problems. Uh, it's, he, it's in this big caricature-ish sort of way, but uh, it, what do we struggle with in, in in the world, but we struggle with uh, one system of, of, of uh, uh, behavior and, and uh, economics versus another. We struggle with uh, competition. We, you know, uh, and people fall by the wayside and get horribly trampled um, along the way um, in the real world. So you know, rapture just takes that a little farther and 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 make, gives you an adventure. But you you often get the feeling, you know, the um, uh, German philosophers have this saying, uh, the feeling of being dropped in. Like you ever feel, and this is something very. These people are saying, okay, he's talking about German philosophers. I'm out here. These these people. Uh, uh, you, do you ever get the feeling you're just dropped into a thing when you're in life? And that's what it's like in a video game. You, you are, mo most video games, you're, you're stepping into some kind of wreckage. You know, uh, uh, you're, you're stepping into a, a world that's, that's, that's either about to or, or is kind of inexplicable and you have to learn that world. And, and you just, you know, uh, they've got to explain it to you as you go in their version. You often find out that it's not true, it's not real. Uh, what you're being explained, what is being explained to you is false. And then you, you, as you go through the game, you find that, that you know, like the real, the reality behind it, and and it's professor somebody's uh, horrible plot to turn everybody into automatons, maybe. Um, and that that is like a feeling that's based on a feeling that's referred to by these philosophers, the feeling of being dropped in that you're dropped into life or just thrown in. They call it thrownness. You feel like you're thrown in and you're trying to feel your way uh, through life as, you know, like, what, what, what is this thing that I'm supposed to do? Like when you first went to elementary school, you had some idea of it, but really you were thrown in. You, you, people pointed you places and they said, do this, and you had to figure it out. Okay, I'm supposed to do this now. I'm supposed to go, and, and a little bit later, I'm supposed to go and disrobe with a bunch of strange guys in, the, in PE. Uh, you're thrown in, sometimes literally thrown in the showers. Uh, you're thrown in and, and you must figure out how, how things are going and, and, the, and where, where you're gonna survive, what's your line of survival, and that's the same thing in every video game. In Bioshock, the feeling of thrownness is stronger because, you, you, you know, uh, even Bill McDonough, when he was in on the inception of it, was still, he was still in, at the beginning of, of uh, Andrew Ryan's dream. He was at the, uh, you, you're, we're going to the bottom of the ocean, seriously? And you want me to help build these things? And so, 
uh, he, but he adapted to that. He went there and he, and, uh, he was captivated by the vision of it. And, and then uh, it just barely held its form for a while. And of course, it began to deteriorate because it was a, a horribly flawed vision. Because there was no, the problem with the world of rapture is that there is no um, counterpoint uh, with uh, naturally built into it. There's only competition naturally built into it. Um, so what that means is that you're leaning f f more and more in a certain direction, you're gonna fall on your face. There's nothing pushing back. It's, it's like the concepts of checks and balances in government, you know? So there, there were no checks on Andrew Ryan. Uh, there was no checks in Pol Pot at the other extreme. He, had, he, he was at a super socialist society the opposite of Andrew Ryan. And there were no checks on him. And Pol Pot uh, uh, created the killing fields in Cambodia. And tens of thousands of people died horribly um, in real life. So uh, Rapture had that innate flaw. And then the, the guts of the place started emerging uh, in people's madness. And so that's what intrigued me about it uh, as a writer conceiving this novel. And I was able to, you know, if you're wondering like how much of it I was able to, to do independently, uh, to artistically, to have how much artistic independence, well, quite a bit because that's why they hired me. They want somebody who will take the thing in its, the shape it's in and not violate it and yet embellish it and enrich it um, and, uh, and explain what's there also. I also wrote some novelizations. I wrote the novelization of the movie Constantine. And uh, that movie, to me, the movie itself and the script uh, that I worked from uh, was pretty confusing and kind of, you know, the internal logic was very faulty to me. I, you know, it wasn't that logical. So I tried to find a way to make it make sense within the rules of magic and you know, demonology and these things. They all have their rules. Uh, and I did, I succeeded, and that book was very popular. It went through many printings, and I got a lot of letters about that. So that's what you always have to do, though. You always have to try and find something that is really hard to understand uh, just on the face of it, uh, and, and you know, find the underlying logic and make that exciting and interesting. Uh, and a, a lot of things here that uh, are, uh, part of that I just kind of like took a rubbing on uh, the world. A lot of them are um, developed in the book in a way that it's uh, on superficially, I'm writing down just what happened in the game. Like when you go to the, when you, when you go uh, at the game, in the game you go to a sort of a, uh, a ride, an amusement park ride. And you and you're seeing like the you know and it's Andrew Ryan's message about how uh, the the uh, uh, the world of of man outside uh, where government is a powerful force um, is it, it crushes the souls of working men and men with ambition and you have this guy who's working on his farm and a giant hand comes down and cr literally crushes him and it's like says on the side you know. Uh, bureaucracy or government or something that's crushing him. And uh, you're seeing that as you ride through. And so I describe all these things that are in the game verbatim, but uh, since I wrote, I wrote from the point of view of Bill McDonough seeing this for the first time, and he was disturbed by it. He was disturbed by the uh, one-sidedness of it. And he was disturbed also by the kind of a, the bigness of, of Andrew Ryan's passions, so that it was like the whole thing was terrifying in a way. And, and yet he, he was by, at this point, his dilemma lot to thank uh, Bioshock for in different kinds of, in structural ways, in the ways the, the stories and choices play out on style. So um, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Right, there's a, there and there are those, 
those time tears, though, or time and space tears that, that are in Bioshock Infinite. And somebody noticed at the, at the wiki uh, that I hadn't made reference to it, because they didn't, they didn't want me to. They didn't want me to, because they, be, they weren't sure quite how, because Bioshock Infinite wasn't developed then. It was just a sort of vaguely formless thing, and they weren't sure how they were going to go with that. So they wouldn't let me put that in. So it's not in there. And it's not, it's not you know, like leaving it out accidentally. They want, they, I was told, also sometimes they said, well, I said, well, what you want me to do contradicts something that's happening that happens in the character's history in the game. And they would say, don't worry about it. Uh, that's wow. just a miss. It's because it was something in, a, in an audio diary about Bill McDonough not having killed somebody, but then I have him kill somebody. And um, they said, and I pointed that out, and they said, don't worry about it. But I get, but somebody at the wiki, the fandom uh, Bioshock wiki, criticizes me for it. But it wasn't my fault. Um, OK. Um, so I guess, I guess that's it. Um, how, is another thing starting, right? Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes, so about time for one more question. Then OK. OK, any other questions? Yes, sir. This might end up giving more like a, a comment than a question, but I, I really appreciated the way you used characters questioning other characters and questioning things going on as a way to kind of like just shine a sidelight on a situation. And yeah. Kind of build out uh, what was going on rather than just having this kind of right. pulled back just description of. Right. I mean, questioning, you know, if you have a character who's like, who's lecturing and, and you know, uh, and denouncing and stuff, no, that, that's pretty heavy handed and it's boring. But if questions, but what could happen with this? How could this, is this morally wrong? Well, and what could be the repercussions? Questioning is a dynamism to it. You know, it's, it's because it's, it's built into suspense. Suspense in, in storytelling is, is, um, is kind of about the question. What's going to happen next? Well, is it going to? Is is this person really going to get shot as he looks like he's about to? You know, as the crosshairs waver over his head. You know, that's a question. Will he get killed? Will he not get killed? As you watch the movie or whatever. You know. Uh oh. Um. So uh, questioning. Questioning rather than lecturing, it does develop all the moral issues, but it has suspense dynamism to it. And you just have to know uh, how much to do and, and just be, you know, pace it out really slow. You have to kind of spoon feed anything that is didactic or you, and spoon feed anything that is uh, expository uh, very carefully. And try and make it, and always try and make it like part of the excitement of the story when you learn something, if you can. And that's just part of the, the skill. And that's true whether you're writing some, an adaptation in a novel as, uh, of something else, or you're writing a purely original novel. Any other questions? No? No other questions? Okay. I'm around anyway. You can ask me things if you think of. Yeah.